Next question. Who's got the mic? Um, I yes. just recently at a theological college, um, and I found a real love and passion for the Psalms there. Uh, and I also share a sadness that we seem to be losing them. That being said, I don't find I get as much as I would like from them being sung. I, but I, I hear, when I hear them said with passion, with feeling, they come alive for me. And oh, the same with Scripture. Oh, and I wondered, oh, oh, whether could you talk about singing the Psalms and whether you felt it, that you got something more from that than you did from speaking? Yes. Uh, I'm lucky, if it is lucky, in that I was a boy chorister in a, an ordinary parish church in mid Northumberland, and I grew up singing the Psalms week by week all through my treble years, as it were, and then subsequently. So I, I am just part of that tradition. And for me, uh, and you know, that tradition is actually very easy. There's a myth abroad at the moment that says, oh, it's terribly difficult. Only cathedrals can sing the psalms, so we parish churches don't do that. It's absolute rubbish. Parish churches can do it. There are good, strong chants, very easy to sing. People can do it. And there are modern translations of the psalms which they can do it in. That's not the only style. There are lots and lots of other styles as well. And I really would recommend it because Augustine to sing is to pray twice and all of that. And also, when people learn something with music, it goes in deeper. It really does. It activates the right brain much more than the words which were left to themselves or slide off into the left brain and be processed rather than relished and imagined and so on. So I do think we have to find ways of, of singing them. And as soon as possible, as young as possible, I long to see a generation of Christian young people for whom the Psalms, even the bits they don't understand, are just their lifeblood. If we don't have that, something very, very serious is being lost from our Christian DNA. Yeah. Maybe a bit, bit more of a comment than a question, but I seem to remember reading that long time ago, and perhaps fairly close to the time of writing of uh, New Testament documents even, uh, people who read them tended to read them out loud, but almost to chant them, to sing them, which seems to fit in with what you're what you're saying to us. Yeah, we don't know nearly enough, sadly, about first century music. I wish we did. Um, we've got little bits of treatises from folk on music, and we don't know what, what it sounded like. It may be that if you go to the Church of the Holy Sepulchre and listen to the Armenians singing, or the Copts, you may hear something much more like what they did then than anything subsequently, but you can't be absolutely sure of that. Um, Yes, certainly reading was normally out loud. Famously, when uh, there's a story from, um, from Augustine watching somebody read with, with, without, his, um, without making a sound, I think, my goodness, normally we do that out loud. It's like Hannah's prayer, which is in the in morning matins reading this morning. Eli just saw her mouth moving. Um, but normally people did stuff out loud. Um, so, yes, uh, and the Gospels... And Paul's epistles are obviously written to be, in that sense, performed. You know, I grieve when I'm in a service, when you get a worthy person. It happened to be yesterday morning in the church I was in. The first reading is taken. This is the word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. And, you know, it's just absolute. And it was a stunning passage. Now, of course, you don't want it overacted and hyperacted. But for goodness sake, let's not be shy of saying to our readers... This stuff is gold dust. Let's actually uh, cash it in a bit. And, and, and we need to take some risks maybe with that. I was in a, in a, um, a lecture course in, in Regent College, Vancouver, a few years ago, and there was an actor in, in the audience for the week who was studying there. And each, uh, Gordon Fee and I were doing the lectures back to back, and each evening we would choose one passage for the worship the next day that was going to fit in with where we were going with the lectures. And, and at supper time we would give this passage, a whole chapter, to this actor and say, OK, that's tomorrow morning. And by the next morning he had got it, and he then presented it. And I remember him doing it with Isaiah 40 once. Absolutely stunning. And you just think... We've, we've experienced it for the first time. Or another time at a conference where, where there was a, a, a wonderfully arcane academic gathering discussing the genre of Galatians. And the, these sort of four or five professors on a platform like this all being very serious. And then halfway through, the, the table was cleared away, and, and a guy came on in, in, a, in a black bodysuit, and he was Paul dictating Galatians. You foolish guy. 
How can you so easily have turned from the gospel? Not that there is another gospel. There's some who want you to... Be, and it was, it was just amazing, on and on and on. And then finally, taking the pen, see what large letters I'm writing with my... It's those who want to make a fair showing in the flesh who would have you... you know. um, and then we had the panel back again, and we had a totally different discussion about the genre of Galatians. You know... Have, have the, and, and, and one other example, because it's fresh in my mind. One of the churches in the Durham Diocese, when we were doing this big read thing, they decided, and it's the sort of church that's got quite a lot of, of key lay people who could do this, they decided that for Lent they would do Luke as their main liturgy. So instead of putting Luke into the liturgy, they put the liturgy into Luke. And they had the whole Eucharistic liturgy, but the, they, they would begin at, right at the beginning of the service, hear the gospel of our Lord Jesus Christ according to Luke, read the first bit of where they were, then have an opening hymn, then a confession, then some more Luke, then some this, then... And they said again and again it was extraordinary how the bit of Luke because they went right through during Lent and ended up obviously with 24 for Easter, how well it fitted with confession, with intercession, with the Eucharistic meal itself. And I thought, well, good on them. You know, it was really innovative. It wasn't disloyal to the tradition in any way. It wasn't throwing the liturgy out of the window. But it really made them inhabit that gospel in a way that none of them had imagined before. So the sky's the limit. Time for one more question, then I'm bidden to stop. Yes. It's just a question about what we choose to bracket out. Uh, there's plenty of the Psalms that we bracket out, and quite a lot of our uh, lectionary chooses at different times to take bits and pieces out of readings. And I wonder what that says about our confidence in what we have in Scripture. It says a lot about the nervousness of a particular generation. And you know, yes, if you have the bit in the Psalm about taking the little ones and dashing them against the rock, then I shudder when I look around the church and I think, are people listening to this and what are they making of it? But I would rather, nailing this color to the mast, I would rather take that risk and say to people, okay, live with this text, warts and all. This is the text that for whatever reason God wants us to have, rather than emasculating it, which is what we've done again. You know, when you see it, you know as well as I do, you see in the lectionary um, such and such verses 1 to 10 and 14 to 20, and you think, okay, what's 11 to 13 about? And, um, and, and nine times out of 10, it's either sex or hell or both. And I've often said to people, there's a lot of sex and hell in real life, and if we cut it out of the Bible, is it any wonder people think it's irrelevant? I rest my case. Enough. Um, uh, who's coming? To yes, Chris. Hmm. Tom, we're uh, enormously grateful for that opening session. Can we just express our appreciation?